If you don't believe in life after death, these true ghost stories might change your mind. We start our night of true stories with the tale of a young man and woman who were given a deal on a house that seemed too good to be true. Shortly after they moved in, terrifying events began to happen. And for the first time in their lives, they found themselves believing in that which can't be explained. Story 1 I bought the house back in 94, and while it's been many years since I've driven by the old place, I can still remember it clearly. The things that happened there are burned into my memory, and though I live many hundreds of miles away from it now, some nights I wake up sweating, feeling like I'm back in the old house and the closet door is about to open, or there's a cold, wet hand reaching out from under my bed to grab me and pull me down into the darkness beside it. I was married, back then, to a beautiful young woman named Abby, and things were good. Yes, good, not great. We had our fair share of arguments and struggles, but we loved each other, and regardless of our flaws, we stood by each other. Abby was the one that picked out the house. We were driving past it, in fact, to a viewing of a newly built cabin-styled home in a subdivision of sorts when we saw it. I say we, because even though I was mostly focused on driving, it caught my eye. Abby had an even stronger affinity for it. Stop, she almost whispered. I stopped. Without a word, she got out of the car, walked up to the door, and knocked. Almost instantly. Almost like she knew Abby would be at the door. An old woman opened it. You're here to see the house. It's for sale then? Abby asked in response. It is. The old woman responded, before adding, but only to the right owner, with a smile. The two of us were given a full tour of the house. It was much more spacious than it had appeared from the outside, and within only a minute or two I had my doubts it would be anywhere near in our budget. But I didn't share my doubts with Abby, and a few moments later the old woman had left us to explore the premises ourselves and seek her out if we had any more questions. You know we can't afford this, right? I told Abby. How do you know? She didn't even tell us the price yet. She was right. She hadn't. That was odd, wasn't it? The place had six bedrooms, three bathrooms, an enormous old-fashioned kitchen set up with two stoves, and an equally large basement and attic. The home was so big that there were still some areas to explore after the tour, but the two of us had gotten a very favorable impression of the place. There's something about this place, you know? Abby said as she looked out the upstairs window of a small bedroom down onto an old swing hung under what looked like an oak tree. Abby reached out and took my hand. It even has a swing, she added. This place is surreal, but if it's above 85, we can't afford it, I told her. She agreed. We walked back downstairs to find the old woman waiting for us in the kitchen with a pile of neatly stacked papers in front of her. Is the house to your standards? She asked. It's wonderful, but we're on a budget, and the owner is asking 84000 He's in a rush to sell it. I remember Abby and I exchanged a look that was a mixture of surprise and bliss. We never made it to our other appointment. We were moved in within a week. The first few weeks were normal if not perfect. We vacuumed the floors, painted the walls, began to fix up the garden. I think it was December when I first saw the ghost. It was the first snowfall of the year, not a lot, but enough to turn the ground and trees pure white, maybe an inch. I've had on and off bladder infections for years, and that week I had a particularly bad one. 
I'd wake up five or six times a night, head off to the bathroom to squeeze out a couple drops, grab a cold pack, and head back off to bed to try and take a short nap before I inevitably woke up in pain again for my bathroom trip. I was on my way to bed when I happened to look out the back window and I saw her, or it, swinging softly on the old wooden swing that hung under that oak tree. It had to be after midnight, but you could see her shape fairly well in the moonlight and reflections off the fresh snow. She was in a dress, not exactly winter apparel, and she was facing away from the house, still swinging softly. I was watching her and thinking of what to do next when she stopped swinging, began to turn her head slowly around towards me, and everything went black. The next thing I knew, I woke up in an ambulance with Abby holding my hand. A tall gentleman explained I'd most likely suffered a stroke and that we were on our way to the local hospital. We got there and the doctors did some tests, kept me overnight, and put me on a small dose of something I can't remember. I didn't tell Abby about the woman. I didn't want her to worry and I think I convinced myself that I had in fact suffered a stroke and the hallucination of the woman was just a part of it. Nothing happened for a few days. Until I got back from the grocery store and found my wife rushing over to the car from the front steps. There's something in our room. I think there's a man under our bed. She latched onto me for a moment and then pulled away, looking me deep in the eyes. Don't go up there. Let's just call the police. I thought the situation over for a moment before convincing her I would go inside very briefly and call them from the kitchen telephone. She wasn't thrilled about this, but I figured if she was right and there was someone up there, I didn't want to chance them getting away and coming back again when I was gone. I'd rather stay here and watch the house while the police were on their way. I walked into the kitchen, Abby right behind me, and I dialed 911. I told them that my wife had heard someone in our room, leaving out the part of it being under our bed as it sounded a little too much like a child's nightmare. After the call, we made our way outside quickly, locked the front door from the outside, and sat in the car waiting for the police to arrive. What did the man sound like? I asked Abby while we waited. Did he say anything to you? She didn't answer at first, not until the police arrived in fact. While the two men were searching our home, she said very quietly, I was taking a nap and I thought it was an earthquake at first. I know there aren't earthquakes out here, but so many years in California, you know? She paused before continuing. After a few seconds, I realized the bed was the only thing that was shaking. And then it stopped. My wife grabbed my hand then and began crying. He was laughing. The man under our bed was laughing. You need to tell the police everything. She nodded. It must have taken the two men almost an hour to search the house. And when they came out, they said how they hadn't expected there to be so many rooms inside. But there was no one there. They looked in every room, every closet, everywhere, even doing a thorough check of the basement and the attic. Against my advice, Abby left out the bit about the man laughing, although she did tell the officers that the man had shook her bed before she ran downstairs and saw I had returned home. The police honestly didn't know what to make of it. They didn't outright accuse her of lying but they did ask if she was on any medication or had been under any stress lately. She admitted she'd had a glass of wine before lying down in bed, but she hadn't felt loopy or something. I suppose that was her own out, similar to my stroke, a way to deny the feeling that something was deeply wrong with the house. One month passed without any incident to the point that Abby and I started to move on from our own strange experiences and began the journey back into normalcy. 
We'd tend the garden, pick out furniture together, and even began clearing out the basement. That's where the next incident happened. The basement. I hadn't noticed how many chairs were down there upon our first few visits to the damp area, but as we cleaned it, we found literally dozens of chairs stacked on top of one another. At first, we thought whoever had lived here last had collected them or something. But when we cleaned off the walls and noticed multiple large blackboards, we realized the basement had been used as some type of classroom. We even found a spare room we hadn't seen before in the very back of the basement. And while there weren't any ghosts, the room was filled with old desks to go with the chairs now scattered about. We may as well clean them, Abby said, and we carried the desks out one by one into the main room of the basement. What do you think they taught down here? She continued. I shrugged. I don't know. Sunday school, maybe? It was a long day, but by the end we had gone through three rolls of paper towels, two buckets of soapy water, and the desks and chairs were set up around the room facing the blackboard. I guess we wanted to see a glimpse of the past, and we even took a picture of the basement classroom, though I'm not sure if I still have it. It was an eerie feeling, seeing the rows of desks, chairs slid under them, all lined up neatly facing the two blackboards. Well, what are we teaching them today? I joked. Hmm, Abby replied. Addition. She walked over to the blackboard, grabbed an old stick of chalk about half the size of her pinky, and wrote on the board 2 plus 2 equals 4. Abby smiled as she turned around. Okay, class, today we're going to be learning... She trailed off, and her gaze shifted over to me. Never mind, it's too creepy now. Let's go upstairs. I agreed, following my wife up the stairs and flicking the basement light switch off once we reached the top. That night, the strange experiences got worse. Much worse. Abby woke me up with a whisper. There's someone in the house. I turned to see her sitting up in bed. She was hugging her knee slightly with her hands and staring at the open doorway to our bedroom. Do you hear it? I listened closely and shook my head no. I was about to ask her what she was hearing when laughter hit my ears. The sound of children. It sounds like children. I said aloud. She only nodded. I swallowed, cursing myself for not having installed a phone line in my bedroom and knowing I was going to have to go downstairs for one reason or another. Even if I did have a phone though, what the hell was I supposed to do? Call the police and tell them ghost children were in my house? I'm not sure if they would show up for something like that and I unfortunately didn't know any rabbis or priests to phone at 1 a.m. for a quick nightly exorcism. Not yet, at least. I'm going down there, I told her, and she replied by grabbing my wrist tightly, looking me in the eyes and shaking her head. Don't go, she whispered. Abby, what choice do I have? It's our house. Maybe some kids broke in and... You know that's not what it is, she interrupted. I swallowed again. I'm going downstairs to find out. I'm coming too then, Abby replied. I nodded. The two of us slipped our shoes on and a sweater. It was still winter and the old house could get very chilly at night. We quietly made our way down the upstairs hallway and then very gently began walking down the stairs. They were creaky, but I think our fear made us walk more slowly and cautiously, and we were almost silent as we descended. When we reached the first floor, we paused, holding each other's hand and listening. I was about to speak when I heard the child's voice again, and another deeper level of dread fell over me as I realized where it was coming from. The basement. As if reading my mind, Abby spoke. 
Don't go down there. I have to. It's our house. Some neighborhood kids probably just broke in on a dare or something. Abby wasn't buying it. I wasn't either. But I wasn't about to call the police for a second time, this time because I was hearing voices in the basement. It was a small town and gossip spread like fire. I didn't want to be known as the town coward. My wife followed behind me, albeit with a half-angry look and half-terrified. She'd known me long enough to realize I wasn't going to change my mind about this, and she was a brave enough woman to not just stand upstairs, cross her fingers, and wait for her husband to re-emerge up the steps. I reached around the doorway to flick the basement light switch on, and was almost not even surprised when there was a dull click and no response. Of course. Luckily, I had bought a new flashlight in case the fuse box ever went out, and it just so happened to be in the kitchen drawer. I grabbed it, pushed on, and mentally cursed myself for not buying the extra big version. We headed down the stairs together, listening for any noises and trying to make out any unusual shapes in the darkness. The basement was silent. We reached the bottom, shining the beam of light onto the desks and chairs that were still where we had left them, all facing the two blackboards in neat rows. You're not going to believe the next part. A small part of me still doesn't. In unison, every one of those chairs turned towards us, making a terribly high-pitched noise as the steel scraped and dug against the concrete flooring. I dropped the flashlight, and Abby screamed. Abby! Abby! I called out, reaching out and grabbing her hand in the darkness while I searched the floor for the flashlight. I found it a few moments later and was about to pull Abby upstairs with me when I realized that her hand felt smaller than it usually did in mine. Shakily, I turned the beam of the flashlight onto the hand I was holding and probably screamed myself. It was the hand of a child. I heard laughter then as it pulled away before I could catch a glimpse of the rest of it and my wife and I both made a desperate run for the upstairs kitchen. Laughter followed close behind us as we sprinted up those steps. We reached the top, slammed the door shut, and this time did call the police. They arrived 20 minutes after the call and didn't know what to make of my wife and I's hysteria. I tried speaking as calmly as possible, but you try being calm after you realize you were just holding the hand of something haunting your house and that you could just as easily still be down there with it. Children, you say, the officer said, giving his partner, a young woman, a not-so-subtle look. I unlocked the door to the basement steps and moved aside. I sure as hell wasn't going down there again. The light down there isn't working, I told him. The two made their way downstairs, both with their own flashlights that were much more powerful than mine had been. Abby and I exchanged looks and listened carefully as they made their way around the basement, spoke to each other quietly enough that we weren't able to make out their exact words, and trudged back up the stairs and into the kitchen. Yeah, there's nobody down there. The older officer said. My wife and I exchanged another look. Are you sure you two heard something? The conversation was more of the same, with us realizing quickly that maybe it was a mistake to call them. I pretended to agree with them that maybe the noises had been coming from outside, and even forced a laugh to farther convince them. But I, I was anything but convinced. I walked with them outside gave them an embarrassed thank you for coming out, and was about to turn around to speak with Abby, when the officer said one last thing. You two, uh, teaching a class down there or something? I turned back around, and thought for a moment before replying. No, the desks and everything came with the house. We just cleaned everything earlier. Oh, he replied. 
pausing for a moment as well, before continuing. So your wife drew those children. He went on to talk about how the two blackboards downstairs were covered with drawings of children. He even admitted that one in particular gave him, and I quote, the creeps. I was about to ask him for farther details when a call came over his radio and he headed off on his next adventure. There was no disagreement after that. Abby and I rushed upstairs, grabbed a quick change of clothes, and that night headed to a nearby hotel. Story 2 The Crying Lady in the Dakota Apartment Building is a brief urban legend about no other than John Lennon from the Beatles. The story goes that John moved into the building in 1973 and was killed outside the building on December 8, 1980. It's said that John claimed he saw a crying ghost lady moving around the hallways of the apartment building. After he died, Yoko Ono had her own ghost sighting as well, saying she saw John's ghost in their room, sitting at his piano. She says that her husband turned to her and said, Don't be afraid. I'm still with you. Story 3 Perhaps you've heard of the Bell Witch. Many stories and films have been based on the old story, most likely due to its incredibly unnerving and haunting nature. The story goes that back in the early 1800s, John Bell moved to a place in Tennessee called the Red River. His family began to hear extremely strange noises and were witnesses to terrifying events. The most frightening occurrence of all were the particularly hateful ghostly whisperings of a dead woman that became known as the Bell Witch. It said she wanted their home for herself and put a curse on them before she died. John Bell later died from poisoning, and some say confidently that the Bell Witch was responsible. Story 4 the story of the ghost of Bellamy Bridge takes place in Mariana, Florida. It is said that in the 1800s, Elizabeth Bellamy married a local politician named Samuel. On their wedding night, her dress accidentally caught fire, and she was scorched with terrible burns over her entire body. She died shortly after the incident and was buried near the Chipola River. The tale goes that her love for her husband was so strong that she couldn't find rest in death and is seen each night wandering the banks of the river still dressed in white, perhaps still searching for her husband. 